Hello, everyone. My name is Robert Mundell, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this special webinar with featuring uh, Dr. Stephanie Kahn on what you need to know about working with first responders. Dr. Stephanie Kahn is a former police officer, and she's a licensed psychologist at her practice, First Responder Psychology, located in Portland, Oregon, where she specializes in police stress, trauma, work-life balance, coping, and resilience. And Dr. Kahn is the author of a book called Increasing Resilience in Police and Emergency Personnel, published by Rutledge in 2018. At the end of the presentation, we'll have some time for your questions and comments, and I'll unmute the lines at that time. Or you can send me your questions and comments throughout the presentation using the chat line, and I'll help facilitate that for our presenter today. Which leads me to you, Dr. Stephanie. Welcome to you. Uh, it's good Thank to you. connect with you online, and uh, we look very much forward to your presentation today. And over to you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to be speaking from the experience of having been a police officer as well as working with uh, first responders in my practice. Um, I also work with first responders in their houses and so far as I go to police agencies, fire agencies and do ride alongs and do uh, training and CISM uh, and peer support training with them. Um, and so I'll be speaking from from those lenses as well as being the wife and daughter of uh, police officers. And so everything, every story that I tell will either be anonymized so that the individual's identities are not shared or uh, I have their express permission to speak of those. And so I'll, again, if I speak of stories, uh, know that uh, I'm doing it in the most confidential way, uh, but I'm using it for illustrative purposes. So. Without further ado, um, I'm going to speak about the emergency service culture, uh, some of the current strains that first responders um, are facing these days, some of the unique presenting concerns that this population has versus a population, uh, other kind of general population, and some general guidelines for working with them, and uh, your to include what the counselor role should be. And then lastly, I'm going to uh, provide a handful of resources, websites, things like that, uh, book recommendations uh, and the like. So, uh, and as Robert mentioned, if you have a question along the way, just put it in the chat box and uh, we'll take a look at it towards the end. Uh, perhaps there will be something you, you're asking me on slide five that I'll be addressing uh, down the road. So, um, so when I talk about emergency service culture, uh, it's important to recognize that there uh, are exceptions to the rule. You know, we, we can't assume that uh, all of the individuals that are first responders are not comfortable talking about feelings um, or are all having problems maintaining work-life balance because my, my experience with them would show that there are some that actually uh, are very comfortable talking about their feelings, are very comfortable with help seeking, that are very comfortable uh, with being proactive about their health and telling other people about it. But, uh, you know, and there's just like any other um, uh, individual, there's multiple intersections where there's going to be generational differences. And I've certainly seen the generational differences in first responders uh, where, you know, they're just going to be culturally a bit different than perhaps some that have been in, been in the profession longer. And so uh, just I don't want to paint them with one brush. I want you to be very aware that there are exceptions to these kind of general guidelines that I'm providing around their, um, their uh, culture. So I'm glad that we're having this kind of training and I've done this training a, a fair number of times in a variety of EAP settings, both in person and online, because unfortunately there's been a lot of really stupid things said in the council room. And I, I can't even sugarcoat it, stupid things are being said. Um, for instance, I was actually hired by one EAP because uh, the individual, the officer that was involved in a shooting went to see a counselor on the EAP list and she asked him why he had his gun out. And clearly that, that did not go over well. That went over uh, about like a lead balloon. And so he complained to the department, the department complained to the EAP and the EAP said, oh man, we've got to do something. So they hired me to do the training. And unfortunately, this is not an isolated event. In the years that I've been doing 
counseling, I have heard probably on a weekly basis, not that I'm soliciting it, but people are actually expressing their relief that I'm not saying these stupid things, but such as, um, you know, I had an off, uh, yeah, it was an officer say he had been to a counselor for eight sessions and was talking about the traumas that he had seen. And on the, the next session, she said, I'm going to have to refer you to someone else because I now need counseling because of what you've told me, which is horrible. This is not an acceptable um, thing to you talk, uh, for profess to deal with trauma, then you're going to hear trauma and you're going to hear the entirety of the first responder um, experience. And so uh, he was then kind of shocked and left to start that process all over again to try to find someone. So, you know, why didn't you shoot him in the leg? Why did you have your gun out? I don't want to hear those details. Um, just ask for day shift since the night shift thing is causing you problems in your marriage and your health, etc. Isn't this what you signed up for? Um, you need to find a new job. And these kinds of comments are not only not helpful, but they, they really would deter a first responder from uh, seeking help because they're going to assume that all people are going to say these kinds of things. And then they go back and tell people in their agency that this is, was their experience. And then in turn, nobody else wants to use the services uh, because they're afraid that every person is going to have a similar experience. And so um, I've even had people that were very seasoned working with first responders <clears throat> doing training with a whole gloom, like several hundred first responders said she makes her um, clients leave their gun in the car. And I'm, <laughs> we all were like shaking our heads going, you're supposed to be a clinician that's squared away and knows what you're doing. And yet you tell people to leave their uh, gun in the car and that's just not acceptable. So, so that's why I'm glad there's more and more of this kind of training occurring so that we can prevent these kinds of things from happening. So with respect to the uh, emergency services culture, and I'll use the word emergency services, public safety and first responders interchangeably, but <clears throat> who I'm speaking of generally is police, firefighters, EMS workers, corrections, call takers, dispatchers, because um, I work with the, the entirety of, of all of these individuals. And one of the things that's really hard for clinicians to understand is the use of profanity and black humor, just really dark um, humor because they feel like it's just uh, very insensitive for first responders to use this kind of language. And so one of the first things I do is tell people, say, say what you would say. Don't, don't censor yourself. Clearly, I'm not going to accept abuse from the person, but I want them to feel free to drop F-bombs or say other things that they and, and use their dark humor um, because I, I want to actually talk to them about what it's doing for them and, and how it might be coming in their personal lives. And if they're censoring that, then that's not a good scenario. Um, they tend to depersonalize because if they um, uh, see a, uh, a victim as a person, that's very difficult for them. That actually increases their chances of being traumatized. And so they have to depersonalize and they do depersonalize. And this is something that they're taught uh, regularly uh, so that um, they can then do the job that they need to do, which is already very difficult. And so it causes them to be um, insensitive perhaps. And I remember when I was doing victim service work for a few years and I went to have lunch with a friend of mine that was a counselor and uh, she said I you got called out last night what happened and I said to her without even thinking about it and I said oh there was a, a dead kid call and she was horrified at um, the insensitivity of what I had said and so and that was when I cued into me oh yes that's right I can't talk to people in that way because they it sounds really calloused but it was what we needed to do to to make the death notification for the kid and those kinds of things and to his parents. And so it, additionally, a lot of people in the first responder profession are very self-sufficient. Um, and so they consider asking for help a, an admission of weakness, an admission of some kind of failing. Um, and they have a number of ways uh, to speak to that uh, where they feel like at the point that they finally come around to getting counseling, that it is that it means that they are no longer self-sufficient it means something when they've actually darkened your door and are in there getting help uh it's not a job it's an identity and i know this happens a lot in other professions doctors are you know kind of um 
involved in that identity and lawyers and those kinds of things. But it's really something that's socialized with first responders in the academy uh, from the get go. There's this prizing of their first responder identity and a devaluation of their personal identities. And so it becomes very difficult for them uh, to have a life or have an identity outside of their work which was actually my doctoral dissertation because I saw my dad, who was almost 40 years in policing, um, have that identity. He, he, he was a police officer first and a family member second and community member third and so on and so forth. There's also a romanticized view of the profession. There's a lot of terminology that's used for first responders in terms of you know, uh, being the sheep dog for the sheep and, and the warrior and these kinds of things because they feel like there's this us and them, that they're protecting people from, from, from bad people, or they're protecting people from themselves. And so there's this kind of romanticized view of the profession. And then more lately, kind of a, a, uh, a, a very disturbing view because they're very uh, oftentimes very discouraged because of, of some of the anti uh, first responder sentiment that's been occurring in the, in the last several years. And then some of them are thrill seekers. And I'll speak a bit about the biological roller coaster of the shift work and having the, ver the highs from the, from the, um, you know, exciting calls and then the, the lows when they're in their personal time. So there becomes a, a desire to seek thrills outside of the job uh, to kind of match those highs that oftentimes come with it. So first responders tend to be more suspicious uh, of others, more private. Um, my husband, uh, when he went with me to an appointment for a tattoo, the, he's you know, made sure and briefed me before we got there that if the guy asked what he did for a living, he worked for the street department, he'd rather say he worked for sanitation than to say he worked for, for the noble profession of policing because he didn't want anyone to know where a police officer lived and the guy would have my contact information. And so, um, and oftentimes they're, they're a misunderstood bunch of, of, of folks because people have their stereotype of what first responder work looks like based upon snippets of news uh, uh, programs or TV programs and those kinds of things. And so uh, oftentimes they're depicted as, you know, these trigger happy um, uh, use of force kind of scenarios because that tends to be what makes the news when in reality uh, they tend to be um, caught and I remember I was as a, as a police officer caught in doing many roles where I was speaking with people about their parenting issues and speaking with people about their mental health issues and speak, speaking with people about their neighbor disputes and these kinds of things and so they spend a lot of time playing roles of counselors and social workers and mediators and judges and parents and these kinds of things because a lot of systems um, either are not properly in place or funded or able to get the 360 coverage people need or they're not available at two in the morning when a crisis occurs and so it it slides back to the first responders um, they are not exactly politically correct when it comes to marginalized members of society because they see a thin slice of the population. And I had a, a cop that I interviewed who said when he spoke up to his, his fiance about um, having a difficult call with a homeless person and he used some disparaging ways of talking about it, uh, it was met with uh, judgment by her, you know, how dare you speak of this marginalized member of society in this way and it shut him down um, when what he really needed at that time was some empathy and compassion and then later have a conversation with with him about his view of society and how it might be slanted based upon that those few number of people. And the issue is, is oftentimes whatever uh, first responders do, they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. Um, if there is a situation where they have to use force, um, and again, this might even be with, it's not even necessarily restricted to police officers, but sometimes firefighters have to do things that look violent. A lot of medical procedures do not look pretty police uh, use of force never looks pretty, but it's what's required to subdue someone who could actually cause more harm if not subdued, if not killing themselves or someone else. But then if they don't do that, they're in their election of their duty. And so if they do it, it looks bad. If they don't do it, it looks like they're coward, cowardly or otherwise not doing their job. And so it's really, they're, they're really caught in a difficult position. And I don't think a lot of people understand that. 
Um, firefighters tend to work um, in larger crews, and so they might work with a group of seven, six or seven or eight people sometimes smaller depending on the size of the department. Uh, paramedics uh, oftentimes work in pairs. Uh, police sometimes work in pairs. Um, you also have volunteer um, uh, firefighters who are oftentimes either EMT or paramedics in reserve who don't get a lot of support as much as the paid folks do. And dispatcher call takers, civilian crime scene folks, um, you know, uh, people that, that prepare reports. A lot of these are left out of the support loop. I went to a debriefing yesterday that included dispatchers and that, that seemed to be a new thing that they're like oh yeah these folks are actually traumatized as well and so it's important uh, to remember that you'll encounter these people who've been left out in many cases so women in first responder work are constantly having to prove themselves both physically and mentally um, and i think this is less so these days than it has been historically but um, historically women were kind of uh, relegated to more maternal roles in terms of kind of working with certain victims or those kinds of things. And I have known some first responder women to actually flat out be told, you have no business even being in this job. Um, sit in the car and do what you're told. And it's that egregious at times. And so, um, but they are actually um, uh, at higher risk in some instances for for traumatization because of some of the of the roles that they're they're given uh, and the intensity of their contact with with crime victims uh dispatcher they tend to eat their own unfortunately very poor morale in dispatch centers they are confined to dark noisy work environments um, not a lot of light tons of unless it's light from from computers, a lot of noise, a lot of just kind of cramped spaces. Uh, oftentimes they will say they're, they're responsible for the first responders in the field, whether that's what I continuously are trying to tell them, you, you are not responsible for someone's safety that is somewhere else, um, and uh, which is a very difficult thing for them because there's that culture. They're oftentimes, as I mentioned, forgotten when it comes to training. I've had, I've done training for first responder agencies and some of the evaluations have said from dispatchers, this is the first time we're ever actually addressed in the training. Our needs are addressed or our issues are addressed. And that's unfortunate, but that's, that's common. Um, and they tend to uh, have a change in communication styles with other. They tend to manage conversations a bit better. They tend to be more get to the point. Let me manage this conversation so I can extract the details that I need. And this clearly causes problems in their relationships, whether it's with parenting or with significant others in some other way, because most other people don't like to have their, their conversations managed in such a way that only factual details are extracted uh, from them. So corrections officers um, have a, their own special challenges in terms of being embedded in their environments. At least police oftentimes uh, can, you know, go and, and take a break and hopefully, you know, get something to drink or go back to the station and they don't have to feel like they have to worry about uh, their surroundings as much. Um, I have seen and heard, not seen, but have heard some horrible stories from corrections officers in regard to some of the things that people in jails and in prisons do to themselves and do to others, where I didn't even think it was possible to behead a person with horse hair, but apparently it is. Um, and if you're in prison for life, um, or, you know, then it, it just doesn't even matter what you do. And so oftentimes corrections officers do not get the levels of support that they need because they're kind of the forgotten first responders. And this is where we oftentimes use the, the term public safety professionals because it's, they're not necessarily responding in society. So some of the current strains for first responders is there's a strong anti-police sentiment by unfortunately, the, uh, the public and the media. A lot of inflammatory language being used in terms of uh, what uh, first responders have to do where they're, you know, speaking of this child that, you know, was, was gunned down by police and then they show the, the picture of this guy from, or gal from high school and in reality they're really six foot three uh, massive and we're, you know, trying to get the person's gun or was assaulting the firefighter. Uh, I've known actually of um, an instance where a person set a fire to uh, a house and then uh, laid in wait with a shotgun uh, for the fire department to show up and then chased them around in the fire truck shooting at them. And um, 
So this is just uh, horrible what's happening. And that's why I'm saying it extends to other first responders that locally we had a paramedic uh, that the person jumped into the back of the ambulance and started stabbing the paramedic. And so they're being ambushed and murdered. Uh, it's up 167% in 2016. So this is a very real thing that you'll see in working with them. And then we also know that more are dying by suicide than are dying uh, by other means. And that's across the board with uh, firefighters, police officers, and paramedics. Um, and so we're trying to get our heads wrapped around this to see what we can do to help these individuals. So Additionally, because of all the publicity and the anti-police sentiment, there's a lot of um, departments are being handcuffed and officers are being told to not use proactive policing, which is what they signed up for because they wanted to prevent crimes. And, um, and again, uh, there's more of a slant towards police in this respect. And so it's really frustrating for them because then they just have to wait and react to a crime and then kind of walk on eggshells in terms of how they want to um, deal with things, which is causing um, staffing shortages because a lot of people are either leaving the, the first responder work either through um, quitting or going out on stress leave and a lot of people are not wanting to apply for this profession because or any of these professions because they are not held as uh, with such nobility as they should be or have historically been and the last one should say very poor morals, uh, morale, not morals. They have good morals. Um, uh, and this is because a lot of the challenges that they're facing um, that I've spoken of. So some of the unique counseling experiences with this population is unlike other populations, there's a lot of media attention around what they um, are working with and working through. They have shift work and they oftentimes will wear a weapon to session. And this, even firefighters come into my office, you know, with knives and, you know, that are visible with the clips on their pockets and things like that. The first responder culture uh, can be challenging because they may not trust you at first. They have uh, big traumas and little traumas and, uh, you know, it's really the accumulation of the small traumas as well as the organizational betrayals and traumas that are problematic. And there's not too many other professions that death of a coworker uh, is a big thing unless it's, it's like Department of Transportation where people are getting um, hit by cars. So the media attention, I oftentimes recommend that folks not follow media depictions of the event. They do it anyway. A lot of times but I tell them, you know, not to follow it. I don't follow it. Um, I remind them of confidentiality, but the inclusions and exceptions, you know, so they don't have to worry about that. I'm going to be doing some kind of media interview uh, relating to them. Uh, let them know that I do this training, but that I don't give any identifying information. It's more a, a police issue than a fire or paramedic issue, but again, it's becoming more commonplace that other first responders are gathering media attention. So one of the challenges is shift work, um, shift work and stress. We talk about, you know, the kind of our systems, uh, you know, we have uh, what's called a tryptophan, serotonin, melatonin, and so tryptophan, which oftentimes comes from from food, things like turkey. Serotonin also comes from food and sunlight, but mostly food. Uh, these convert to melatonin, which induce sleep. Uh, if you're not getting sunlight, you're not getting the serotonin. If you're not eating proper foods, you're not getting the serotonin, which is going to affect your melatonin, which is going to affect your ability to sleep. It's going to reduce that. And when you're not getting good sleep, either because of overtime or shift work is interrupting in your parenting uh, demands and those kinds of things, then you're not going to have the serotonin levels. And so your serotonin is going to reduce, which is in turn going to reduce your melatonin, um, which is going to further cause sleep deprivation. It's going to reduce your dopamine, which means you're going to reduce the pleasure when you do actually go out and do things. And it's going to reduce your secretion of endorphins, so it's going to increase your pain. So first responders, when they get to their day off, um, oftentimes they're trying to recover from an overnight shift or a weird swing shift with overtime. And then they're trying to move into their, uh, to everybody else's kind of schedule so they can be around their family, um, but they end up forcing themselves to go out and do things. They don't have the, they don't feel like it because their serotonin levels are low, which is again, a mood chemical. When they actually do it, they don't get any pleasure out of it because their dopamine levels are low. And then they're more achy because they've gone out and done something physical. And, and so it's caused their their pain level to increase. And so it causes this um, very negative experience where they're like, why did I go out in the first place? Because I didn't want to, I didn't enjoy it. Now I'm achy and sore and more tired because of it. And so 
it's something that I recommend people you know really get pay attention to their sleep hygiene so they can improve uh, their mental health their mood and uh, those kinds of things and they end up with a variety of other issues around cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, things of this nature where their, uh, you know, heart rates are going up and their blood pressure is going up and these other kinds of problems that are associated with this, as well as um, from, I learned from a sleep study or a sleep presentation that a lot of first responders um, or people that don't get eight hours of sleep um, actually have uh, more deposits on their brain, more plaques on their brain, because you actually need eight hours of sleep to clean the deposits off your brain. Um, and so that you wake up with a clean brain, so to speak, to go through the next day. And so if you only have four hours or six hours of sleep, then you wake up with those deposits that haven't been cleaned off your brain and then you have more deposits built on those because your, your brain builds deposits as you're awake. Um, and you end up having a higher risk of having dementia or Alzheimer's. Uh, firefighters have particular challenges with sleep because uh, oftentimes they're woken up throughout the night um, and so uh, they do not get restful sleep. So a lot of times shift work um, uh, includes voluntary overtime. Sometimes they, they volunteer to do that, but other times it's compulsory overtime. They don't get holidays off. They don't um, oftentimes have a choice in working uh, overtime, and so they end up being more exhausted. So two levels of stress, operational and organizational, and we know that the organizational stress it doesn't matter what organization you work for is actually much worse for first responders than the operational traumatic stress a lot of times because it isn't what they are prepared for. And so, um, you know, the shift work again, kind of that, the, the physical changes that occur from lack of sleep, the paperwork is, you know, getting more and more um, uh, uh, convoluted and complicated and then even workplace politics and conflicts because they don't expect the, the betrayal and they, do expect that the traumatic events and are given training to that degree or towards those things, but no one teaches them in the academy about organizational betrayal. And so they don't really know what to do with that. The operational stress is both the primary trauma to their safety and then more often uh, than that is the secondary trauma, which is their exposure to other people's suffering. And then again, the routine stress of the scrutiny, which I've spoken of and their frequent flyers that they're seeing on a regular basis that uh, they're thinking, why is no one else picking up and helping these people? Why does it always keep falling back to us? And they kind of feel hopeless that that's going to change. So when it comes to the big trauma, which is, you know, again, the big T, the trauma that involves their own personal safety, um, they might minimize what their trauma was if they compare it to other people's. They do the compare and despair where they say, well, you know, I wasn't in fear of my safety as much as so-and-so was, or I wasn't the one that had to pull the trigger, so-and-so was. And so there's this kind of pushing away of resources or minimization of, of how they're um, struggling with something. They might think a normal reaction is abnormal, again, because they're not aware that it's pretty common for people to see the face of a dead person on another person um, afterwards, unless they get that psychoeducation, which is again, part of our job. And they compare how they're feeling on the inside to everybody else's outside. So that's a good thing to point out to them as well, um, because everyone else is doing what they're doing, which is hiding how they feel internally. Uh, the death of a coworker, and, and I've unfortunately lost three of my own uh, fellow officers, and so um, uh, a lot of times people will say, if only I had done this, they will blame themselves for this, if I had not taken that day off, or if I had come in sooner, or if I had done this instead of that, um, or, they, or if administration had given us this resource or that, or it's a lot of times for being one that survived Bill Hager, uh, relating to the person's death. Um, and, you know, I just again recommend be aware uh, of the media coverage because oftentimes, especially online stuff, you've got trolls that will say horrific things about someone dying. Um, and so I just recommend that people abstain from looking at those things. And there's when, when someone is murdered, justice and there's anger of the investigation if the person denies it if the person claims some kind of self-defense thing or those kinds of things when they kill someone it's very problematic and i know when i saw my co-workers murder um 
he actually mouthed to me, I didn't do it. And I knew, I knew he did. And I was angry. I was so angry that he would say such a thing to me. Um, and then there's the, the death of the coworker by suicide, which unfortunately has occurred more and more these days, which is very problematic because the anger that comes with that and the guilt, people are thinking, what could we have done differently or what could the department have done differently? So secondary traumatic stress is oftentimes referred to by a number of names, vicarious traumatization, secondary trauma, cumulative trauma, complex trauma. Um, and more often than not, the person is going to develop post-traumatic stress response from this than the primary trauma where their life was or their, their uh, peer's life was in danger. And, we, and Ellen Kirschman refers to this as death by a thousand cuts, where it's the person just keeps being exposed to the suffering of others. And it's and, and those you can't unsee what you see. So they keep seeing and hearing, uh, you know, in the case of the dispatcher, these kinds of traumas. And they just have this cumulative effect where finally it's that one that's at the tip of the iceberg that causes things to all come crumbling down. And they don't they're they're surprised by this. So they'll come in your office and be surprised that they're having a reaction to this call. And in reality, it's stacked upon, you know, uh, several others. And so it's something to normalize that this actually happens quite regularly and probably more often or definitely more often than the other. And because it's the singular event, that one tip of the iceberg doesn't seem to be enough, they will oftentimes dismiss it um, or it will um, be uh, suggested that it's, oh, well, they're just having marital problems or they're having health problems. And it won't be actually seen that it was all the traumas that took place uh, below it or before it that were actually the, the uh, culprits, if you will. And so the incident rates for first responders, as you see, vary uh, widely. And this is because it depends on who you ask and what criteria and how on. So the general population around nine percent um if you were now, I would say partial ptsd is actually as bad as full-blown full diagnostic criteria for ptsd and is far more common um, and so paramedics have tend to have the highest rate because of their proximity and exposure to uh, uh intensity of exposure to trauma victims because they're sitting working on them in a very intimate setting so what does it look like people move from a state of of um being dependent on each other and trusting each other, trusting others to chronic suspicion of other people from feeling that they're safe and can rely on their training to a heightened sense of vulnerability from a sense of, okay, I'm in control of circumstances to a sense of I'm at the whim of whatever's going to happen because this keeps happening. And from a state of being independent to oftentimes a state of loss of personal control and freedom. And so uh, this is sometimes what happens over time. And some of the symptoms that you might uh, they might observe in their coworkers or others might see is just, you know, they might avoid calls uh, or not show up for work, or they might be at work all the time, but they're not, they're phoning it in, so to speak. They're not really um, uh, fully present in the calls that they're attending to. They might have conflict with coworkers or, or citizens because they're amped up hypervigilance and their threat, perception of threat. And then they might have some cognitive fogginess around, they might be accident prone or forgetful or making mistakes in reports or chart notes and things like that. And so those are the ones that are very difficult for people to recognize because they want to assume or they will assume that it's something else because it's not the depictions of post-traumatic stress you might see on like Chicago fire or Chicago police or those kinds of things. So some of the things that their family members might notice is, again, that workaholism because they're going into work to try to keep themselves busy so that they don't have to uh, have the images in their mind or think about what's, what's bothering them or avoiding work um, because they're afraid to go to that next call. There's kind of an irritability, a, a baseline of kind of agitation that sometimes occurs where they're less patient than they would normally be. They're not sleeping or they're sleeping a lot, uh, one or the other. So some shift in their sleep pattern. They might increase their drinking. They might increase their eating. They might increase their gambling. They might increase um, online activity or distancing from other people. And a lot of times they'll show up in the body. You know, they say there's issues in your tissues and people will be having uh, uh, pains and, and aches and headaches and stress in their jaw. So non-operational workplace stress consistently has been reported as more distressing again, as I mentioned, the trauma because it's unexpected. They, they 
there's a mistreatment oftentimes by administration and there's a denial of their injury. Um, they'll blame their family members or their depression or they're not cut out for the work. Um, oftentimes the coworkers will actually um, give the first responder difficult, uh, difficult time because they're now having to pick up extra shifts or they don't understand uh, what's happening with this person because they were on the call with them and they didn't have that same period of trauma and so they don't seem to understand what's happening for that person and so there will be judgments around that um, and they'll question those that have the mental health issues. I've actually known of a person who mouthed off to another person that had attempted suicide and said get it right next time uh, which is horrific. Um, so there's that's along the lines of the workplace bullying which unfortunately happens um, uh, in, in this profession. So again, the workplace hassles, I've spoken about the paperwork. Um, it's really funny, the mandatory training, my husband attended training on work-life balance, which was mandatory on his day off, which is an oxymoron if I've ever heard it, which was actually challenged in the class. So like, hey, if the department wants us to have work-life balance, why are they calling us in on our day off for training? Um, and so, but oftentimes, Times people have to put in their dues if they want to promote or get a specialized assignment. So um, uh, they do that and then lo and behold, they don't get that specialized assignment or promotion and they feel that betrayal. Um, and I've spoken ad nauseum about the unsupportive public. So one of the things is the identity role constriction or restriction. And again, I mentioned that we're socialized in the academy to prize that first responder role and to devalue uh, that personal identity and it creates you know, kind of this pattern where over time they become more and more identified with this uh, first responder role and they're like, I can't hang out with these people. And sometimes you can't, they can't hang out with other people um, because of their activities or schedules or that kind of stuff, lifestyle differences. Um, but oftentimes it has more to do with them just um, wanting to be around their own and so they end up being around other first responders um, and which means that they now no longer um, have other views of things, have other options, you know, kind of problem solving sources of information. And so they start managing or policing their family. And even firefighters police their family, dispatchers and corrections officers police their family and asking them where you're going and what they're doing and those kinds of things. It is very difficult when they leave the job, which eventually they will. And I had a fire guy tell me in my research, he says, I don't want to leave the department because I don't want to go from a hero to a zero. And so in his mind, he was nothing if he was not doing his job, which was a horrible thing to think. Um, but he had said, my first wife didn't tolerate my marriage to the job, so I got rid of her. This one actually tolerates it, uh, which was horrifying to hear that, that this is how he um, was conducting himself and how he thought of his relationships and how he thought of himself. But some people, you will leave because of retirement, they will leave because of medical reasons, whether it's stress leave or physiological, other physiological reasons, or they'll be terminated. And this is high, puts them at heightened risk for suicide and other kinds of problems. So the biological roller coaster, Kevin Gill Martin talks about it in his book, Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement, um, where uh, first responders will go to these adrenaline filled calls. And, um, and so they'll go from call to call and they'll have this excitement. Um, and then they come home chemically exhausted at the end of their shift. And that exhaustion becomes coupled with their time that they spend with their family members. So Work becomes a high, a chemical high, if you will, um, in some instances, and then family members become associated with this kind of chemical low. And so they will um, find it to be very boring to be around family. Again, with they continue to pair the high and the low. Similarly, and I've certainly seen this in both as, as a clinician and as, as a friend of many first responders, is the psychological roller coaster that occurs as oftentimes when they're in uniform, um, they, uh, you know, are in, in their, their cars, they are in their trucks, or their rigs, this kind of stuff, all eyes are on them, there's a specialness. Um, and, you know, kids want to, you know, have costumes, want to be like them, or dressing as firefighters or cops or those kinds of things. And and so there's this kind of specialness that comes with them. Um, you know, we have a number of names for, for women that tend to like men in uniform, badge bunnies and this kind of stuff. And so some of them are enamored with the idea of this, this role and family members are not so much. Um, and so they go from having this kind of high and other times highly hated, um, uh, but to this kind of 
low when they're in their personal life and they're just wearing their regular clothes. Uh, they don't feel special. They don't feel uh, the family might treat them like, okay, hey, you know, yeah. And I've even had the wife of a firefighter say, I'm, I'm not in love with the idea of you being a firefighter. Help me with the kid and help me around the house. You might have other people that are impressed by that, but I have a hard job too. And so, and it's not uncommon for the spouses of first responders to say, my job matters too. Uh, I'm not in love with the idea of yours as, as you are. So oftentimes first responders will come home and they'll be disengaged in their personal lives. They, they can't make, they've made decisions back to back to back throughout the day. They can't make another decision. So this leaves them kind of uh, in a non-committal, non-engaged stage in their relationship um, where family members will say, hey, what do you want for dinner? Or what do you want to do on your day off? And they're like, whatever, I don't care. Whatever you want, doesn't matter because they can't muster up the energy to make another decision. And they just, um, again, are kind of at a chemical low. And so, and they might even be sleeping a lot or watching TV or playing video games or being online because they're kind of zoned out because again, they're, they're tired. If you ask them what they do on their days off, they're just like, I don't know, nothing. They're not good at planning what they'll do. So other times, again, they'll have some uh, risk-taking or thrill-seeking behavior around retail therapy or other kinds of things, you know, riding dirt bikes or off-road ride, bike riding, that kind of stuff. So some of the consequences of riding roller coasters, they spend more time at work than at home. They have what Kevin Gilmartin referred to as used to syndrome, or that I used to do this and I used to do that. And I oftentimes will have to give first responders a list of here's some activities you might be interested in doing, um, or what did you used to do before you started kind of getting this narrow identity and start planning those things on their days off because otherwise if they don't plan, then they do nothing. Um, and the negative impact of thrill seeking behavior and lifestyle, uh, they tend to have uh, more health issues because of that. Um, either they're not discharging the toxic chemicals from the stress uh, or they're drinking or, or having accidents or things like that. And sometimes even having financial difficulties because of some of the choices that they have made to try to cope with the stresses of the job. So one of the things I recommend folks do is uh, encourage their clients to develop multiple identity disorder uh, or multiple identity to avoid disorder. And I give them what's called an annual check-in where they say, okay, who was I when I first got into this work? Was I a partner, a family member, a churchgoer, a soccer player? Uh, what was I? And to take um, that inventory every year on the day they were hired on, or the day they were sworn in and to actually ask family members to do this with them because they oftentimes can't see the changes that they've made so family members can help them along the lines and hold a mirror up to them and I know even for me in my own policing work my husband had to, to do that to me he had to continuously hold up a mirror and say Stephanie you've gotten too engaged in your gang work you know you've you've really kind of lost sight of what you used to do and how you are um, and so really just paying attention and when and, and I'm happy to send this uh, to anyone that's interested in it this annual check-in where you're charting your priorities and you're checking to see if you're living consistently with them or having them do this to see if they're living consistently with them because they'll oftentimes say, well, my family is, is number one, but their behavior really doesn't indicate that. Or my health is, is more important than, than my work. Uh, and they'll say that sometimes, but the reality doesn't pan out that that's uh, the reality there. Uh, their actions don't back up what they're saying. So in terms of family, um, and this is my, my classmate Rob and his kids, they, it's a, he turned to the dark side, became a firefighter from having been a cop. Um, and so family members are oftentimes, as I've mentioned, they get the exhausted first responder at the end of the shift. They're affected by the changes in the dispatcher's communication style or the firefighter's communication style. Um, they're affected by the secondary trauma. They mimic the symptoms of the post-traumatic stress disorder. So if the person comes home and is hypervigilant and doesn't want to go places or go in crowds or is asking the kids questions about where they are and who they're with and what they're last names, how they're spelled and that kind of stuff, their significant others will start to do the same. Uh, they'll jump when the first responder jumps because uh, either they're, they're starting to, to pick it up in kind of an emotional contagion way, or they'll actually share some of the traumas uh, when they talk about their days and then they're traumatized by that. 
They oftentimes are the recipient of the public scrutiny, of the media scrutiny, especially in small towns. They'll be asked, hey, your husband was on that call or your wife was on that thing. I saw him on the news. What happened? And, and so people's private lives are pried open by, by nosy neighbors and, and other things. Or even if they're not asking them, they're looking at them. And so it's made it very difficult for first responder families. And first responder families are not oftentimes included in the psycho ed or the support or the debriefings or those kinds of things to get them what they need in terms of support. They're not even usually given handouts uh, in regards to what they might expect someone um, would act like or be like following a critical incident. So again, the secondary traumatic stress, and this it says police families, but this is all families, you know, will they'll police the family. Again, the first responder will. They'll distance from them oftentimes, and sometimes it's because they're distancing from everyone, and other times it's they don't want to tell them about the traumas that they're seeing because they're trying to protect them from it, but it causes a wedge between them because the first responder is trying to protect them, but they're actually just withdrawing altogether. Um, and then sometimes the family members will distance from the first responder because they don't want to burden them with what what's happening in the family. And so they end up kind of doing this divide where everybody's trying to protect everybody else from what's going on. And they, they, they start to feel like roommates. And again, the, you know, I think I've, I've spoken quite a bit about the post shift slump and the communication. So some of the strategies, and I'm just going to give you some of the short term intervention strategies in this, in this brief um, webinar is I will, when I'm working, with them, I am very thoughtful about my psychoeducation because I don't want to. I understand these are very intelligent people, problem solvers, and so when I tell them, "Hey, I'm going to tell you some stuff that you would not know unless you'd had my training. You're smart, you're a problem solver, but I don't know how in the world you'd know what I'm about to tell you unless you specifically studied it." So it, it makes it more palatable for me to share information with them. And so I say, you know, "Hey, there's this thing called just world theory, and it says good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people." And when that doesn't work, it gets crossed. Then we start blaming ourselves or others because that's unsettling for us uh, when something bad happens to good people. So I just want you to know that's quite common, um, but it's also not helpful. So it's good to be aware of that. And the trauma-related guilt, that's also common, but not helpful. And here's how it typically looks. And so letting them know that that's, and I was doing this yesterday at a debriefing, it's common for you to feel that way that for that guilt, but it doesn't mean it's, it's accurate or helpful, which is the, the criteria. Oftentimes, uh, I will use very concrete language, more focused on thoughts. I use the word reactions rather than the F word in, in this line of work, which is feelings. You know, how are you reacting to that? Or what did you notice physically? To, you know, these kinds of things. I mentioned that I will recommend that they schedule uh, pleasurable activities and to get them off the biological roller coaster. And so um, if you Google list of pleasurable activities or scheduling pleasurable activities. I'd put some filters on the Google search there and maybe not use your work computer. Uh, who knows what you'll come up with. But when you do that, you'll see that across the nation, clinicians are actually doing that because a lot of people in a lot of professions are starting to lose sight of what their interests are outside of work ever so gently. So I'm trying to get people to plan their days off and do things with their family in advance rather than uh, getting to their day off and then trying to determine what they feel like. Because if they wait till they feel like doing something, they won't, they, that time won't come. So they actually have to do something behavioral and then the feeling will come afterwards. So very, very gently, I will challenge their schemas about the thin slice of the population. Some of those not politically correct ways of seeing people in society but I'm very tiptoey about this. I've got to have some rapport and I got to normalize, hey, I can see why you would think these people are dirtbags or, you know, idiots or this kind of stuff. I can, I totally can see that. I can, like, that's all you're seeing. That's all you're seeing. Um, yet, how many people call you to tell you to come take notice that little Johnny did his homework, ate all his vegetables and is very respectful to his parents. And so I challenged them very gently to actually go out and try to find those instances in their personal lives in some kind of way. And I said, cause you know, if, if I did what you did, I would think everybody was having marriage problems because I only see it then no one comes to counseling to say, oh, look how great I'm doing. So I have to do the same thing you're doing and challenging my own self. So again, I try to normalize what it is that they're having to do to try to see um, the kind of the whole picture rather than just this thin slice of people that keep doing stupid stuff. And then I give them a lot of information, again, psycho on sleep hygiene, because that's a foundation of health. And I tell them this stuff is, seems kind of silly that I'm telling you this foundational things like get good sleep and drink water and this kind of stuff. But there, again, I normalize it. 
it's pretty common to skip over those basic things because it's too obvious. And so I give them recommendations about that. Some of the other things that I recommend, and again, I work with families, so oftentimes I will give them communication training, to, you know, to how to better communicate with each other, um, how to communicate with other people that are busy bodies, and give them what I refer to as pocket responses when other people are asking them about calls, where they just do a real quick, thank you for asking, uh, we're not able to talk about it, or we're not up to talk about it, how are things with you, is so-and-so still playing, you know, soccer, and so just a quick acknowledgement of their question and a redirect, and so it's really good for them to have that information prepared, because if they don't have that prepared, they're blindsided when someone says, hey, your wife was on that call, wasn't she, or she, and then they're like, uh, you know, or they'll avoid going out because they don't know how to deal with that, so I teach them to have those communication strategies just to bat that stuff out um, and getting really good at teaching family members how to communicate um, with their significant others about what they're seeing to actually and I use the, 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 the saying of a chaplain friend of mine care enough to hurt their feelings um, and so uh, tell them what they need to know it's hard to, to say it but do it in a, in a, in a from a place of caring and concern letting them know that they're not um, their same selves. And so in, in encouraging them to be in their personal lives and maintain plans and maintain their own well-being. So oftentimes they'll see us uh, as uh, people, and I was referred to as a shrink yesterday um, at a debriefing, but they feel like we're either over, we're aloof, um, but we're oversensitive. So we're, we're going to you know, have a hard time hearing the, the entirety of their, of their trauma, uh, that we can't handle that kind of stuff, that we might end their career or interrupt their career or get their, you know, um, have a consequence to their, uh, to their work. And so uh, it's very thoughtful that we actually name what we think they might be thinking. And I will say that. And I said, you know, I want to be really clear what my communications are or that I don't have communications with your employer, and if you ever see me in your workplace, um, know that uh, uh, it's, it's, I'm gonna be treating you as if I've never met you before, these kinds of things. Um, and so we've gotta be very thoughtful about how we um, dispel these kinds of myths from the get-go. We actually put them in the room so um, we, they know that we know about that. It's difficult sometimes for them to be helped by us because they are the helpers. They are the rescuers and they don't want a burden. And I've had, had a paramedic said, I, before I unload my trauma on you, I need to know how you take care of yourself. And I don't like to focus on what I ever do, but if I realized we were not going forward unless I was forthright about it. So I said, okay, this is what I do and that's what I do and that's what I do. Now can the focus come back to you? And so then she allowed that to happen. But um, and they might test you. I've had some people that have used pretty graphic stuff and then, and I'm just like, okay, yeah, that sounds like a really, really crappy call, those kinds of things. And then they, it's funny because it's almost like I feel like they send someone out to test you. And if you're any good, they go back and tell three or four people and then their friends start coming in. So it's really important that you uh, develop that rapport with them, but also be aware of your own limitations. If you are not able to handle trauma and you are not trained in trauma, do not pretend to be. Um, you know, getting trained to things like EMDR, brain spotting, tension release exercises, those kinds of things are important. Uh, so don't, don't take that on if you can't take that on. Um, and learn the language, you know, learn the, the jargon so they don't have to constantly explain things. I tell people when I was doing individual debriefings last week, I want to know probably 99% of what the jargon is. So feel free to use profanity and jargon. But if, I, if there's something you're using that I don't understand, I'm, I, I'll, I'll jump in and say, hey, what is that acronym? Um, but uh, I try to get them to recognize they can speak freely. Generally speaking, you're, the guidelines is you're not an expert. You're just a partner with them along the way. You're just a facilitator. When I do trauma treatment with EMDR, I'm just facilitating what their brain knows to do. I'm just here to support you and normalize some stuff and give you some information I happen to have some training on. Really low key. I'm not, I use my first name. I'm not the expert here. I try to be very collaborative, um, being very explicit again about confidentiality. There's a lot of myths about what counseling does. People thought we video recorded or audio recorded or that we had to tell certain things. So I tell people, I have never had to breach confidentiality. It would never gotten to the level of that. It's not to say that it won't happen, but just to kind of clear up some of those myths. And again, I tell them, I'm not an evaluator. I'm only a supporter. So you will never, I will, if ever someone in your department determines you need a fitness for duty evaluation, it will never be me doing it. And so again, I make those things clear.
Um, again, I've mentioned, let them know they can say anything. Initially, again, you're a them and the us and them dichotomy. So being very transparent about everything, I will actually send them a message and said, I'm going to be in your house. I'm doing some training. If you'd prefer that I not do a ride out on your shift, because I'm not sure which shift you're on, let me know that I have a way to get out of that um, without having to reveal any reasons why. Um, and showing my own humanity. And again, so there's sometimes, again, the focus is to stay on them, but I will sometimes say, hey, I, I struggled with that when I was an officer or I've known others. And to, again, kind of lessen that us and them, higher, lower, better, worse kind of thing. Um, and no psychobabble. I don't, you know, I don't say, where do you feel that in your body or this kind of stuff. I've had a lot of people use counselor speak and a lot of people use psychobabble. And so, um, yeah, just be really thoughtful about the language um, that you use. Um, many will wear weapons and again it's not even restricted to cops it's a lot of them uh, and you got to be comfortable with that and I completely am comfortable with that and asking them not to bring those things like asking you to leave your pen at home it's just it's part of their stuff cozy in office spaces and so I've had people ask was everything okay because I had one in my office and so I cracked the joke I said oh yeah I've been passing these checks and it was eventually going to catch up to me so kind of having a pocket response for the other people in your workplace that are nosy about what they're doing. And so, um, and there's a, a quote there from Kirschman, uh, Kamina and Faye, when they talked about um, how important it is to be able to let folks uh, wear their weapon into therapy uh, if they need to. So these are some resources and this is not um, uh, exhaustive by any, any means. These are just some of the resources that I'm recommending. I'm embarrassed to actually say Blue Help is not listed on there, but uh, it is one that absolutely should be on there. Um, and as well, even the Department Peer Support, Critical Incident Stress Management. And these are resources, not just for you, but even for them. Uh, sometimes it's good for them to recognize that they have a peer support team that might be able to help them on a regular basis if you're not available or critical incident stress management team. But for you, it's important that you do a ride along or a sit in or whatever it is to make sure that, that you have your finger on the pulse of what's happening in the department or happening in first responder services and even though I was a cop um, I still do ride-alongs and I still um, go to fire departments just to make sure that I'm um, staying on top of things and the current uh, challenges that they're facing none of us are above um, needing to continue to do that, those kinds of things that's part of our ongoing cultural competence these are some resources clearly I'm partial to the one in the middle but Kevin Gil Martin's has stood the test of time I still consistently refer to that uh, for other um, for, for many reasons. Um, and Captain Dan Willis's Bulletproof Spirit is also a fantastic resource. He and I exchanged books and I'm very impressed uh, with this uh, retired captain. He, he could easily be a clinician with the amount of, of information he provides. And then here's some relating to relationships. Um, and the two in the middle are Ellen Kirschman who's a guru in this line of work and the others are just ones that have been recommended to me over over the years um, and then uh, counseling cops is one that's fantastic again written by ellen kirschman mark Kamina, and joel fay um, which is a good resource and a recent one that i've encountered is ryan galax um, one there in the middle which gives you a lot of the verbiage for fire mm -hmm. Karen Solomon's uh, resource there. So uh, some suggested readings, um, the Kubani and Ralston talk about the trauma-related guilt. That's one to get your head wrapped around because it they don't use it specifically to first responders, but I that, that fit more perfectly with the first anything by, by John Violante um, would be a good stuff uh, in terms of he's a, an expert in trauma research, uh, research with first responders. So here's my uh, contact information, my website, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook. If we're not already connected, please do so. Uh, consider me a resource, an ongoing resource. And uh, if there's anything that I said that you're like, oh, you mentioned that, can, can I get that or where's that from or these kinds of things, whatever is, is mine is yours, I'm happy uh, to share resources I've recommended and referred to along the way. So we should be right at, oh wow, I couldn't do it more timely if I tried. Um, what questions have come up or thoughts or? Yeah, uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stephanie Khan. I, I'm so impressed with your presentation and um, you've given so much uh, valuable content that has uh, helped me understand the, the intensity, not only of the work that first responders do, but the intensity uh, of, of caring for them, you know, the, the demands that are placed on therapists to care for uh, first responders in all their needs. And of course, you've given some very helpful strategies and uh, helpful resources too. So I appreciate that very much. Um, I have a number of questions, uh, but first okay. I'd like to uh, unmute the lines if there's anyone who has any um, questions first, I'd be happy to facilitate that. Okay, um, some of the questions I have, um, what's a typical day like for you in your practice if there is such a thing? Ah, uh, typical is like the word normal. I don't know how to identify that. Um, it's pretty busy. Um, it's, it's a good problem to have. It's uh, going from, one person who's at 75% towards their healing and then the next hour is a person's brand new and I'm I'm right back at the very beginning where I'm building rapport and stabilizing and and then you know a couple of hours later I'm I'm really happy because someone's nearing the end of their uh, their work and so it's uh, you know it's it's kind of an up and down um, as uh, as the day progresses and then other times like I've had many individual and, and one group debriefing in the last couple of weeks because of shootings that have occurred, occurred locally. And so it's meeting people at their, at their worst and hearing, you know, just kind of the worst of the worst over and over and over again, and uh, trying to do my very best to give as much as I possibly can. Um, and at the same time, uh, not over talking a client and giving them the space to ask questions, but it's, it's, it's interesting because other times I'll have an influx of, like I said, one person will test me and be kind of the, the test case test. or I'm the test case for the department. And then three or four people will, will, he'll go back and tell them, yeah, she actually was, you know, uh, easy to talk to. And then I have a whole bunch of people and then I just have to be very careful about, because they will tell each other they're working with me, but I can't talk about it. So that that's a, that's the funny challenging scenario that's an interesting feature of your work i think how you build that kind of uh uh trust and rapport with individual clients but then how you build your reputation in the community where they would they would refer maybe their colleagues to you if they feel that you're someone that they can really trust and uh and benefit from yeah it leads me to my uh, at the beginning at the outset you talked about how you know vicarious traumatization is so critical and that some therapists um, can't handle what they hear mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you gave an example of a therapist just reflecting in the moment that he or she would need therapy now based on what uh, the first responder the client had just shared with them and um, what would you recommend for let's say a new therapist or what kind of self-care would you build in to your practice to anticipate the intensity of what you're going to hear in, in your line of work as a therapist? Well, I think you've got to um, have a few things in place. One, you've got to have someone you can talk to, uh, get your professional consultation with, um, and have your own practices in terms of your, your exercise and your sleep patterns and that kind of stuff. But I think probably even one of the bigger ones, in addition to kind of having those, those individual pieces there, is you gotta have your head wrapped around your role too, because it's, it, it's an interesting thing because the people you're helping are helpers. And you're gonna tell them, oh, you can only help to a certain degree by the time you get involved, too many things are in place, you can't stop the train that's, that's running. Um, but you have to do the same, take the same mindset as a helper. You can't assume you're gonna, you're gonna fix everything or you're gonna um, repair everything or you're gonna just have something brilliant to say and it's always gonna work. You have to have your head wrapped around the limitations that you have as a helper. Um, and so I think that's a, a big thing is to, uh, to be aware of that because you can put undue pressure on yourself to save a person because your heart goes out to them, not unlike them having that same thing in their work. Yes. 
you know, at the uh, uh, planning stages of this webinar, I, I was anticipating questions I might ask you and I jotted down some thoughts around, um, you know, the trend that you might be seeing. And I, uh, you actually addressed this and I was alarmed to learn that, as you said, there's been a 167% increase mm -hmm. uh, since 2016 in, in experiences of ambush and murder. I mean, the, just the risk that first responders enter into, mm -hmm. I mean, that is incredible. And mm -hmm. so that's a whole other aspect of this kind of work, isn't it? Yeah, it's and, and I didn't say it. I mean, how many of other professions do you know where you have to be thoughtful about where you eat uh, and who's serving your food? And I had that as a gang detective and I walked up to it, order my food. And before I could even order my food, the woman alerted me that I was the person that took her uh, family car away and because and, it was uh, we, we confiscated it. And I was like, well, clearly I'm not eating here anymore. Um, <laughs> and what other professions do you have to be aware of that kind of stuff? Mm-hmm. Incredible. Have there been any changes in the work environment for first responders in light of uh, what you've been talking about today, the research around PTSD or, you know, trauma, sleep deprivation, deprivation, like there's been changes to other professions, for example, um, medical residents or other high stress occupation, occupa occupations like, um, Airline pilots in terms of the sleep that they get, the rest between shifts, uh, air traffic controllers. Have there been any positive changes to uh, the work for first responders in terms of the, their scheduling and um, support for their work-life balance? I. Uh yeah, but I think we have a way to go. There's been a lot of research that, uh, and Brian Vila out of uh, Washington actually is kind of the expert on the sleep uh, and first responders and shift work, although he's recently retired in the last couple of years. But um, uh, so we know that the 10 hour shift is the ideal shift uh, versus 12, which, you know, tends to be 13 with paperwork, that kind of stuff. Um, so we know a little bit about that, but the other positive change that I'm seeing is there's a lot more uh, peer support teams being built uh, because historically it's been SISM teams. Um, so they, they were kind of fashioned around the critical incident stress management response to the critical incident uh, rather than it being kind of the death by a thousand cuts that Ellen Kirschman talks about that kind of wear and tear of the daily stresses of the job. And so departments are more and more realizing that there needs to be a peer support element that needs to be proactive um, and building people's resilience and giving them information around getting better sleep, uh, around getting better nutrition, about uh, communicating with their family members better and having more activities outside of their work. And so I think they're, they're incrementally moving towards that. And I think that's why I I, now I'm spending a lot more time doing trainings or building peer teams and things like that because agencies realize that hopefully one, it's the right thing to do for the human beings that are doing their job. And two, it's much more cost effective for them to put that money on the front end and help these people in that capacity than it is to, to replace them because they've left the job or to, to pay them to be out on stress leave because they've, their health has deteriorated. Um, it's just more humane and cost effective to do the work on the front end for these folks. Mm -hmm. And finally, I, I was struck by um, how there's, there's uh, groups of people uh, uh, within the work environment and then families at home who might tend to get overlooked. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, one, how do you reach families? How do you um, connect with them and, and provide psychoeducation and care and support for them? Um, and also, I was struck by how dispatchers, you said, are oftentimes overlooked mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And there's vicarious traumatization in their line of work. And I think mm -hmm. if I remember correctly from your biography that you started out as a dispatcher mm -hmm. and wondering about um, your feelings about them as well. Yeah, just even this month, I have two family retreat, one family night that I'm doing for a fire department and then a family retreat I'm doing for police. And the, a, a lot of times they're, they're connected through social media. There's a Facebook page for police wives or police spouses or family members, uh, those kinds of things. And so there's a virtual community and then oftentimes people will identify what their local community is. And I think there should be a peer support team, one that's for the, for the line folks, one for, that's for the 
um, retirees and one that's for the family members so that uh, when people, and I know some departments actually do the, the family member ones, they don't do the retirees as much as they, uh, as the family member ones where they say, okay, these are the spouses who've, whose significant others have been in an event or this kind of stuff. And so when someone's hired, they get, they get introduced to, the, to that group. And so those people meet um, and the department sometimes sponsors those meetings or uh, allows use of the facilities of that kind of stuff and bring in speakers and those kinds of things. Like the thing I'm doing, it's the fire department that's um, uh, uh, hosting it. And they just send out a, uh, an agency wide email for the firefighters to invite their significant others. And then I promise, I, I, promise I won't ask you to tell uh, their deep dark dirty secrets in front of their peers, wives or husbands or whoever. Um, and so a lot of it's coming either through the department peer teams incorporating them or social media um, groups. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. And the dispatchers, sorry, the dispatchers. Yeah, I, I, I'm connected with the local 911 center and because I had been a dispatcher before and so oftentimes I will, uh, go in and do training specifically for in their house. I just, they, they, their building is right by my office, but, uh, and then there are, I'm not the only one that, that does that. There are other dispatchers who've become clinicians or who have become trainers that actually um, uh, go around and give it very specifically to them. And there's some organizations, Nina and APCO and such that host that kind of training in those conferences as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've learned a lot today and I really appreciate this opportunity to learn from you and to connect with you online in this webinar. And I really appreciate your generosity and willingness to, um, to share your knowledge. And so thank you very much. Of course, of course. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right, if there's any other questions, now's the opportunity to ask them. Any other questions or comments you might have Otherwise, we'll wrap things up. And again, thank you very much to Dr. Stephanie Kahn for the presentation today on what you need to know about working with first responders and their families. Thank you. Thanks.